Okay, welcome back to Tripbow.com. We have a brand new bow journey here with a uh, another Pacific U stave. Um, this is for a client mine out of Atlanta, Georgia, or somewhere in Georgia, I believe. He wants a 70 inch English longbow, about 50 pounds. He's got a 29 inch draw. And so I'm just going to start this number 740 out on a I, basically, I need to be able to see what's going on on this stave. Uh, there's a lot of activity. Uh, probably should have let you see it before, but I, I want I, I need to see it better myself. What's going on with all the activity beneath the, this bark here? Some of it I could see, but I need to see what's going on. The back of the bow here, in this case, is going to determine a lot for me as far as what I um, can remove or what what basically how I'm going to lay this bow out because so I need to be able to see the back of this bow clearly as possible and make some marks on it. I think in general this is a really nice stave. It has a good sap line and uh, it's got plenty of mass but it's just there's locations where the mass may need some finagling which you know makes the bow making more fun. But, uh, And at the moment, I'm not going to clean it to perfection. I'm going to get it to where it will reasonably allow me to make marks on the back of this thing. This is a lot of surface area like this. This is obviously going to be much, much larger than the bow area. I'm just doing this so I can put marks on the back of this bow, back of this stave here, see what's, uh, how it can uh, adjust what's going to be removed. Then I will continue to remove the rest of this membrane afterwards. Right now it's not really necessary to remove all of it. Okay, what I'm going to do from here is the obvious. I'm going to continue. I'm going to get this uh, bow down to this, this stave down to this category of debarking so I can put marks on it. And then we're going to put this thing in the bandsaw to slice off some of these, um, some of the spanned out look. We're going to, we're going to locate the, the, the bow mass that needs to be kept. And on the next video, we'll cover uh, the areas that are going to be problem points, priority areas, and uh, so we'll take it from there on the next video. Okay, we have now come to the stage here. I just de just did a very rough debarking of U bow stave um, 740, and this is the 70 inch bow stave. Uh, it's going to be for a 70 inch bow. This was going to be for, and I was going to briefly go over some of the things we have to deal with on this stave. This happens to be right smack in the middle of the, in the handle area, which actually is okay. It looks worse than it really is. That, that's probably even gonna go away, that limb shadow in there. Uh, let's see here. This is pretty big chunk of stuff up here. It's got a, a lot of mass in there uh, going in. But I think it's gonna fall away from the belly of the bow. For one thing, I'm actually 
removing a good chunk of that. I, I kind of, I, I, I formatted this concept here with removing a lot of this because I'm focused on what's happening on the back of the bow. Um, the belly should have, a, of course, plenty of mass in which to deal with. So my focus, that's one of the reasons I debarked this, is I couldn't really ch see this way that I wanted to on the belly. I did find a general center area, but I don't like it, so I found this is to be the better way to do this. Because after all, this is where everything origins, origins from on your bow is the back of the bow. So I structured this layout in relationship to what area I have worked with in here. And I think we're going to kill a lot of that guy right there. Because and this is kind of an illusion here. But we've, uh, we'll be probably be dealing with a certain amount of this thing in this range, in this area. Uh, we'll see what happens with it. So now we're just going to slice some of this off with the bandsaw.
we have uh, knocked down, as you can see, quite a bit of bulk. And uh, I've drawn some, the, uh, the basic line for locating the handle and the bellies. So we, what we're going to do now on the bandsaw, and I can do this with a knife, but these big knots like this, I like to take advantage of the bandsaw to scoop these out. This is going to be fun. I, I, I'm interested in how that's going to work out. But I've, I've done very well with these before. They, they look worse than they really are. In fact, they look really cool when they when they actually become a bow. They they have that really big corrugation. And but anyhow, without further ado, let's uh, get this guy in the bandsaw and knock out some of this uh, belly mass here. Okay. Actually, know what to do first. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, let's do this real quick. I'm going to do a couple of these. Uh, sorry. I want to get some of these kind of. I like putting those in before. Uh, kind of gives you a, a chance to escape every now and then. Especially. Crazy spots like that. All right, now we can try it. on the pearl bandsaw. They're really, really hard. stave roughed out. Um, I normally, if the stave isn't too thick, I do the tapers first. But that's not necessarily a rule that you have to follow. It's just something that I tend to do if the stave isn't too tall. Some of these staves have been really tall this way, so it's kind of hard to do that. So what I did here is I knocked down the bulk both on the sides. I created a cube-like stave, you know, shape and everything so I could work with it. 
and I was mapping out. And I now I have my tapers. I've got my handle location here. I've got the scoops out on there already. Um, that's just all identification where everything is in general. Now I gotta. Uh, I'm gonna start off with the most challenging limb. In fact, this limb through the whole process is going to dictate a lot of things because it's going to because of the location of all the masts or not. I, I'm pretty sure it'll be fine, but I have to pay close attention to it um, throughout the whole process. Otherwise, if I if I become complacent about it, well, that's when that's when errors happen. Is when you don't really pay close attention to stuff like this. So we're going to go ahead and knock down. Uh, some of this uh, taper, get it ready, get it ready to uh, shape the taper in the limbs. Actually, we'll start this side. the blade up tall to accommodate what's coming up here. Itself is a test of patience because <laughs> it's such a large chunk of area. Okay, we go down this side. This one here had that really big corrugation here. It's going to be interesting to deal with that because it has such a raise up in the limb. This 
it's going to be it may get a little more flexible as it loses mass but that's the, what we're really going to have to work on here is bringing this guy down and working around this thing they actually look worse than they really are but the main thing is is you don't want to create a divot that keeps popping out so that's exactly what can happen with this so the main thing is is before and after this point it's getting it prepared to deal with uh, material material removal because without it goes without saying that what happens before what happens after here is what's going to affect how this thing remains stable uh, what things uh, cause it to have um, the most impact now, a lot of this is going to go it's going to actually go away but the divot the scoop in there that hump is going to remain I'm going to have to tighten it in the frame a little better a little bit I'm going to wobble it in there okay get this ink in there a little tighter going to be a little symphony between brass and knife again. I generally kind of prepare it for the surface. of a bow limb this space up in here has it it's like virtually perfect um, and this would be too so we have our, um, our little challenge point right here which adds greatly to the interest this is an interesting thing down a little ways.
see how deep that goes in. This is what I'm talking about when the You have to be careful of how much material you remove between these two points. Don't get too too carried away with it. Now this is going to get pretty lean down here, but you don't want it to get too lean because it has to support this point right here. progress with UVO stage 740. We've got uh, some pretty reasonable limb action. I think the current limb action is stronger than 50 pounds at, uh, at 28 or excuse me 29. So we're going to do some more work on this but the, the progress is great because I mean this this limb here is actually pretty stubborn. I've been having to really kind of just really increment it down. But the, the thing is, is with this with this level in the game you don't want to go too much too fast I'm really careful with it I've been noticing it of course it really wants to fight in mid limb here quite a bit early limb it seems like it wants to be up further down it wants to fight quite a bit Right around the corner from putting us in, in the tiller front. But the limb action is beginning to happen. the early limb and I mean it's already happening in early, early limb I want it to happen more down in here now seems like it's beginning to though it's breaking down I normally don't like to I like to use this sheet metal scraper or kind of more like in true tiller but sometimes it's nice to go ahead and use it to kind of define, clean up rough spots and really look for just the highs and lows in your material. doesn't look like it removes a lot, but actually it removes it quite a bit. This is kind of a concern point. It's pretty dense. It looks pretty stable, yet it's, it's something that you have to, as, as you lose mass in that area, you have to consider what's happening with it there. close to going ahead and uh, uh, testing this in the tiller. The other limb is a little more cooperative yet, so not much left to do on it. Just maybe some, a couple of areas ahead. Right, we have to be careful in here of head and, and behind how that's going to work because of the tension, the, the drop and change of, of the tension compression relationship is a little bit out. You have to pay attention to that. Thank you. 
as scary as it looks. We're really trying to bring this to a nice taper here. I want to get this down where it's about as it falls into about a 9 16 5 8 range. Tapering about a, maybe an inch and an eighth in this range. No more than an inch and a quarter in this range. This is still probably a little bit heavy down there. I'll, I'll, I'll refine that as we get to tillering it. But the width back here might be a bit much yet. I think so. We'll refine that handle here pretty shortly. It'll be slightly pronounced on this one. The customer is not requesting a uh, a blended handle in this case. So we're going to probably have a slight pronounce there. I do like handles. But I also do like the effect that the blended the blended U-bow can affect too. That's great. That beautiful D-shape is quite impressive. Okay. All right. What we're going to do now is uh, I'm going to scrape a little bit more on this side. And get it to where it's 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 uh I can feel already we're gaining something. We'll work we'll work some more on this guy here. I'm gonna sand the back of this thing so I don't have any funny sounds. I got a bunch of loose membrane back that'll peel off because I don't want that popping sound in the back when I go to tiller it. We'll talk about that some more. Um, it's a habit I've had in the past. So I'm in a big hurry and I want to hear it. also this crackling sound and I'm going what's that sound? And all it is is, is the membrane popping away from that back from the the top growth ring. So we'll sand those out, or scrape and sand those out before we get too carried with tilling this. We'll talk to you guys in a little bit. Okay, here we are with uh, the u bow stave 730. No, I'm sorry, number 740. So u bow stave 740, I've already put this in the tiller test, kind of did a test see how it would bend. We're going to take a look at it again and check it for weight. And uh, this is the rough tiller. This is almost always out by uh, anywhere from five to 10 pounds. This rough tiller, what it does is it sees how the limbs are bending. It gives you a general, very general idea of what's happening with the weight. So we're gonna go ahead and put this guy up in here. And, you know, it actually, it actually bends very uniform. We'll take a look at some of that bending right now. Let's go ahead and bring it down to, uh, I don't know, 0.4. But it's really cool. Even with that corrugation, it actually bends very nicely. And from what I'm seeing, this will be between 48 and 50 pounds at uh, 29 to 30 on the draw. So it has a little bit of range in there. But if you see where it's at, 30 inches right there, that's, that's a nice, nice uniform, you know, effect. And it's pulling right at about almost 50 pounds right there. And this is not true tiller. This is off this rough string. I don't rely on this as for actual. Um, I know this bow is going to actually be a little heavier than what's showing here. So I take it down. Right in this range here. And we're, we're getting close to 50 pounds right there with this rough tiller at uh, around 29, degree, uh, 29 inches. It feels really good. I think it looks great when it bends. It's, it's, it's probably going to be a very powerful bow. So what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to uh, here, Nathan, get some get some of that on on. Uh, here, let's watch this thing a little bit here. I like I like how it's actually bending for having such oddities in it. Maybe I'll turn it just right there. So it's really a a nice feel to it. This bow is going to shoot. Shoot awesome. So next step on this guy is uh, we're going to put in some knocks. And I imagine within a short time we're going to be doing a test, a couple test rounds with this. So okay, with the Ubo 740, we're going to prepare to uh, tone down these tips, bring them to a nice sleek taper to prepare for knocks.
them down to, it's, I can tell that the camera doesn't give a very good example of this because it looks a lot sharper in, in um, my perspective than it does for uh, what's on cam. But these are actually pretty narrow tips there. So I'm going to put in some knocks here and we, we will refine them one more time. I don't want them too narrow right now because I want to create a reasonable shoulder. Then I can refine them after that. So at this point, we're just going to uh, measure in the lines and get ready to install these knocks. You motherfucker. You got to be kidding me, you son of a fucking bitch piece of shit. You cocksucker.
Okay, right now we're cutting in the, well, you, you saw in the previous video me tapering these points, and I have them marked now, as I've done before, I come in a half inch, a little extra point on there, and I have a standard grace of about three quarters of an inch, another, say, your total length is about an inch, inch and three quarters, so you got enough to create a close to a 45 degree uh, knock right here. And as I will always repeat, because I have to repeat it for myself, um, if you ever do this, be sure that you um, cut your line, or your knock line, towards the belly of the bow, towards the handle of the bow. Always. I've had to resize a few bows as a result of that failure. paper I may go a little deeper with that This little saw allows me to create kind of a, a little scribe line for that drill bit to follow. It gives me a chance to look in there and see what I'm doing. I've actually cut these entirely out with this in a piece of sandpaper. It's a little slower, but you can make some really nice knocks this way. And I, really, this is, this is a really good way to go about this. It's been the most consistent. Find a consistent way when you do this that works and uh, there's it gets the objective quickly. Some guys use chainsaw files. That works. Okay. Double trip up on the sandpaper fold. Kind of get that. Now deal with you on these, you got to be careful with how you handle this wood because it can chip and flake away. But if you do it right, it actually works out very well and it can make a great knock, a great point. Had very successful ones with that. I don't like how I did that for just a second here. I like that little... There we go. Alright, so I'm going to do the obvious and get the other side done and we'll... Be back in a few minutes to string this up and get ready to fire it. Okay, fire here we are with uh, you both, Dave. Um, 740. And uh, we're going to give it a test shot here. We got it braced well at uh, right at the 6. And I might have pulled on the string a little bit ago. It does feel, when I pulled on it, it does have a good feel to it. And it, and it feels like it's definitely at least a 50 pound bow. It did tell her to that. Oh, it's, this is different when you um, shoot it a little bit. So now we're just going to break it in. We're not going to just, you know, break it in a little bit. I think that would like that Flemish twist that I'm used to.
all around it releases real nice. Okay, this is where a customer ordered a, uh, a really ugly bow, he said he wanted. But, uh, he spotted some stuff on eBay and he wanted one, a U-bow 70 inches long. Um, these things perform very well, and it's got, I think it's not that ugly, it's got the beauty of nature in it. And it certainly shoots, performs, I think, all around very well. It's very fast, and uh, has a forgiving release. I might have some refining to do right here so that the riser doesn't have as much of a paradox on it when the arrow goes off, but it still, all around it shot pretty good. But this is Ubo Save 7, number 740, and... Uh, I have the videos up on the website. Okay, we got uh, Ubo Stave um, 740 here, and I just test shot this thing, and it uh, it does what it has a kind of a goofy handle. It shot well, shot pretty, pretty it shot fast and everything, but that's kind of a, heck of a paradox on there. So I'm, I'm going to put a little recess, handle recess in there. I'm not going to carry it away with it, but just enough for his comfort in the grip. And uh, we're going to go ahead and do this on the sander here. I rough it out on here, and then I take I take a, uh, a fine brass and then a um, sander to finish it out. do from here is I'll take the smaller rasp here and uh, I'll just I, I kind of got a, a feel for the size of that handle now I knocked off the main bolt the main thing I want to do now is to make it work not just comfortable but it allows the bow to be shot with some accuracy so and I try to leave as much of the sapwood here as possible I'm encroaching too much in here on this even though this is not a blended handle I don't want to engage with too much removal there. Um, you want to keep as much as the sapwood up and down the back of that bow as possible. It's so thick here though and most of the limb action tension is and compression issues are happening you know between here and here but there's still some drag here there's still some you know still some activity. 
but because it's so much thicker here than a blended handle because a blended handle you can't really tell uh, it's barely different you know just enough but in this case there's a, a, a fitted feeling so you have a little more bulk there so you kind of get away with it you got a slower you have an actual slower fade whereas in the uh to compare the two i'll give you a brief comparison here to compare a blended handle or a more a blended handle to a pronounced handle you put them like so you have a you have a fade and a fade you know you have a you have fade action happening so you have a reasonable amount of bulk in there so you can kind of get away with some of this stuff here but once again you don't want to get get too much into taking too much material off the back of that bow so all i'm going to do here is i'm just going to shape this as you see it is not, I'm not going to carry away with. I'm not going to do this like I do the form fitted handles. I don't really do that with you. I get kind of a, a shape where it fits well and it looks good. I like a nice looking handle. Um, I'm kind of one of the, the handle guys here. I don't really, you know. I mean, I don't. I don't mind a blended handle on a traditional, truly traditional English longbow. But when it comes down to the bottom line, for me as a bow maker, I kind of like the feeling of the handle because it's artistic, you know, and kind of gives it a, uh, uh, a sense of um, appearance, you know, classy look. In this case, it's important because this handle that I'm forming right now will actually influence the performance of this bow in terms of how I release the arrow. How this guy is going to do that. So it's generally shaped about where it's going to be right now. I'm going to sand this smooth. It's not the most perfect shape yet, but once I get the sander on it, we'll clean it up. And uh, we're about ready to put some, some finish on this thing. We'll do one more short test with it and see how it does. I always test it after I do this kind of thing because there is a change. It may not be dramatic, it may not be noticeable, you just don't really know. And you is different about this kind of thing because of the sapwood being like it is, it's not like hickory. The stress transfer is a lot more sensitive from end to end so your your your, your combatant issues in in bending in it with you is a little bit um fussier so you have to pay more attention to where you re remove material it's it's an easy wood to mill an easy wood to cut but it's an easy wood to screw up very quickly because you don't understand the mechanics of the tension and compression element it can get kind of you know it can really throw you out of the ballpark on it you can waste a lot of money on you very quickly um, by not getting well acquainted with, uh, especially like maybe a premium stave. I get, I get a lot of wild staves and I do some crazy stuff with it, but that takes some time. So anyhow, I'm going to get this sanded up and uh, get ready to post it up for this customer to um, buy it.